Welcome to Critical Race Conversations, a series hosted by the Folger Institute with the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation as part of the Institute's 50th anniversary programming. I'm Owen Williams, Associate Director for Scholarly Programs at the Folger Institute. We're delighted to gather so many friends, old and new, for these conversations. I'd like to take a moment to introduce the series and our session leaders for today's event. This series of free online sessions features scholars who are offering new insights into the prehistory of modern racialized thinking and racism. Our speakers are acknowledging deeper and more complex roots to enduring social challenges and conducting more inclusive investigations of our contested pasts, all with the goal of creating a more just and more inclusive society and academy. The Institute is providing the framework and platform, but as is our practice, we turn to scholars across disciplines and career stages to lead discussions from their own experience and expertise. We recognize that we should allow others who are more knowledgeable about the field of critical race studies to create the conversations. We have much to learn. In these critical race conversations, we are actively experimenting with new technologies and new ways to foster dialogue and present content, just as so many of you are in your own classrooms. For this session, we are foregoing YouTube's live chat feature. Our speakers welcome live tweeting with the hashtag FolgerCRC. We remind you that this session will be recorded and posted on the Folgers YouTube channel as soon as it is processed with closed caption enabled and a transcript will be uploaded next week. Please contact the Folger Institute with any questions or concerns. Today our session leaders will offer an important and timely discussion that merges Shakespeare and early modern English studies with black studies and sound studies to showcase ways of inter integrating critical race studies into the classroom. They remind us that every humanities professor already teaches profound lessons about race, whether or not they intend them or are even aware that such lessons are happening. Let me now briefly introduce our two presenters for the second event this month on how teachers and college faculty might work to actively dismantle racism in their classrooms. Dr. David Sterling Brown, a Shakespeare and pre-modern critical race studies scholar, is assistant professor of English at Binghamton University. He is a member of the Race Before Race Conference Series, Exe Series Executive Board. Dr. Brown's published and forthcoming scholarship in Radical Teacher, The Sundial, The Hair, Arden's Hamlet, and Titus Andronicus State of Play volumes, and other venues, centers on Shakespeare, race, gender, and or pedagogy. Prior to entering academia, David worked as the Connecticut Recruitment Director for a national nonprofit in the K-12 fight against educational inequity. Dr. Jennifer Stover, a scholar of African-American literature and culture and sound studies, is associate professor of English at Binghamton University. She is co-founder and editor-in-chief of Sounding Out, the sound studies blog, and her first book, The Sonic Color Line, Race and the Cultural Politics of Listening, was published by NYU Press. Before entering her PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity from the University of Southern California, Professor Stover was a high school English and AVID teacher for six years in Riverside, California. Without further ado, I give you The Sound of Whiteness or Teaching Shakespeare's Other Race Plays in Five Acts. Thank you for that introduction, Owen. And thanks to the Folger Institute and the Folger Shakespeare Library, the Mellon Initiative in Collaborative Research and all viewers, and to our colleagues, Dr. Netta Medadizade and Ambarine Dadaboy for offering the first conversation in this Folger Institute series. We also must thank Binghamton University and our department for letting us teach how we want to and need to teach, especially given that our distinct anti-racist research agendas are inextricably linked to our pedagogical agendas. And finally, we offer a special thanks to the K through 12 teachers out there for there would be no higher education without all of you. Before we get started, we also want to make two important points and recognize certain limits pertaining to the hearing impaired. First, the sonic color line and the listening ear, Jennifer's concepts that we'll be relying on today, describe a hearing culture that is also ableist. The way listening is limited to the ear, for example, in European culture, because it is closest to the mind and reason, even though we know that we listen through the whole body as vibrations hit it. 
The sonic color line and listening ear are ideologies that impact our individual embodied listening, which operates on a spectrum from full body only to fill body and ear. Secondly, the sonic color line and listening ear are very connected to bodily carriage and proper comportment. So it is likely that the impacts of this can be perceived through visual cues as well. That is to say, people perform listening often in very exaggerated ways. Thank you for performing that, Jenny. <laughs> I got you. To be clear, racism is also a painful reality within the deaf community. As the National Deaf Center on Post-Secondary Education noted in their June 2020 statement on racism and oppression. And they added specifically that disparities in opportunity and outcomes for Black Deaf Americans are incredibly high. For today, Jennifer and I have incorporated a lot into this critical race conversation with the hope that since it is recorded, you will take advantage of the opportunity to rewatch it and share it with others. And on that note, we'll now turn to our overall objectives for this session. We have five main goals. First, we wanna encourage teachers and challenge you to think not just about individual plays, but about each act in the five act play structure as an opportunity to explore race and especially whiteness in white centric Shakespeare plays like Much Ado About Nothing, Richard III and Hamlet, for example. Plays that have not been as central in Shakespeare and race conversations as they should and need to be, mm -hmm. despite important work in this critical direction by many scholars. For example, and I wanna name a few of them, Arthur Little, who draws on the legal scholarship of Cheryl I. Harris to reflect on whiteness as property, Peter Erickson, who among other things asks in the past, can we talk about race in Hamlet? Matthew Chapman, who scrutinized the importance of the black presence in Love's Labor's Lost. Patricia Parker, who has examined the English Renaissance racialized preoccupation with blackness, soiling, sullying, and dulling in Hamlet. Scott Newstock and Ayanna Thompson, who offered a robust co-edited volume, Wayward Macbeth, which features work on whiteness and Roman Polanski's Macbeth by Francesca Royster. And of course, Kim F. Hall, who in her first book, Things of Darkness, deployed black feminist methodologies, explored the fetishization of white skin and boldly demanded that the field take seriously the critical interrogation of whiteness. 2020 marks the 25th anniversary of Hall's pathbreaking study. And so Jennifer and I will use this session in part to answer Kim Hall's 1995 call for this kind of Shakespeare and pre-modern critical race studies scholarship must be centered more frequently. And the centering of discussions about whiteness must be normalized by all pedagogues and especially book presses and journal editorial boards, as argued for in the Race Before Race Executive Board's recent call to end publishing gatekeeping. Much is at stake with respect to understanding the invisible workings and history of whiteness, white supremacy, anti-blackness, and racism. As these histories coupled with the realities of now significantly affect all students. Another goal of ours is to showcase how Shakespeare and critical race theory are complementary, and to suggest concrete methods for how teachers can consciously, consistently, and conscientiously offer lessons about race in relationship to sound, the latter concept having been explored by Bruce R. Smith in the acoustic world of early modern England, Gina Bloom in Voice in Motion, Staging Gender, Shaping Sound in Early Modern England, England, and in a 2010 special issue of the journal Upstart Crow titled Shakespearean Hearing, and that's volume 29. Race stands not apart from, but as an important part of the sound and hearing conversation. I suggest as much in my article, The Sonic Color Line, Shakespeare and the Canonization of Sexual Violence Against Black Men. 
an essay in the sundial that offers examples of how to apply Jennifer's sonic color line ideology in the pre-modern context. As Shakespeare's plays present us with racialized soundscapes that prompt us, as Bloom suggests, to reflect on the materiality of sound. Why does sound matter? And how is sound matter? This critical conversation is a program of action. Thank you, David, for starting us out um, and for that wonderful introduction. We have a couple more goals. We're gonna work on reinforcing the power of empowerment with respect to student learning and racialized authority in the classroom. Um, one of the things that white professors in particular should be more self-reflexive about is our unearned authority at the university and the classroom. And I say unearned here because I'm not referring to our educational credentials, achievements, abilities, those are of course varied, but rather the immediate assumption of belonging and the quite literal command of the room that is structurally granted to us simply by inhabiting our bodies in the space. I'm rarely taken for a, a student, for example. Um, while differences in gender, class, and sexuality temper the force of this unearned ideological authority, everyone white has some kind of access to it. In a society structured by white supremacist ideology, whiteness comes with the force of the state behind it, and therefore the expectation of automatically being listened to. Um, whether or not we're teaching Shakespeare, but especially when we're teaching Shakespeare, why is that? What are unspoken lessons about race do our bodies teach? What can Shakespeare teach us about how such unearned power came to be and how we can dismantle it? What possibilities for teaching and learning open up when we're aware of our racialized bodies um, in the classroom? And rather than reinforcing the lessons that they teach, those unspoken ones, how can we work to empower students and dismantle that unearned authority? We're also gonna reflect on how sound is racialized today, how race is both a visual and aural phenomenon, as I note in the sonic color line. And to think about Shakespeare's plays, even individual acts and scenes as racialized soundscapes. And we'll talk about what a soundscape is, where sounds have invisible, racialized and critical power that, that kind of gives us the, the affect and feeling and making of race, um, you know, that's what, creates white people and white spaces. It's the making and performing of race. And we're gonna show you that today. Finally, our final goal is to help teachers think about pedagogical prep so that you are ready to hit the ground running with your students on day one. Both David and I have a lot of pedagogical training and experience at multiple levels, secondary school, public and private universities. We know how important it is to start class with strategies in your pocket to begin this work. So let's begin the work. Um, Let's go. What do you say, David? I say, let's get to it. So right now, uh, you should be seeing our front slide, which has a phrase that was part of the description of our talk. Um, quiet as it's kept, every teacher already offers profound lessons about race. And the question that we want you to think about um, and also give you ideas to help you think about is, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. And so, among other things, the five act structure of this critical race conversation is meant implicitly to call attention to the notion that race is performative. As Margot Hendricks suggests in her essay, Gestures of Performance, Rethinking Race in Contemporary America, an essay that gestures toward the sonic color line. Our five act structure also acknowledges how gender is performative as Judith Butler argues in Gender Trouble. I, a black man, and Jennifer, a white woman, are acutely aware of our racial gender differences, which we are deliberately relying on here as educational tools with respect to our collaborative development of ideas and how we've structured who talks when and who says what to whom. We maintain this awareness as well in our individual classrooms at Binghamton. Because racialized sound exists in most classrooms, and really wherever you are in any given moment, we want you who are watching and listening right now to be acutely aware of our racial difference and of your responses to our different racialized identities. And more importantly, our voices, how they sound, how they make you feel, how you respond to them as listeners, 
You might even consider closing your eyes for a portion of this session to see what you learn about you. Give it a try right now. Are you resistant to my black voice, which is not emitting from a white body and therefore not the norm with respect to Shakespearean authority? Are you more willing to give Jennifer that unearned authority she just spoke of because she is white, despite the fact that she is a scholar of African-American literature? Does my masculinity complicate your response to Jennifer's white female voice? And does our crossing into each other's respective fields, as we'll speak later, disrupt the assumptions you might have about the scholarly knowledge we should have? And to echo sentiments expressed in Eric DeBarros' article, Teacher Trouble, Performing Race in the Majority White Shakespeare Classroom, is society's ambivalence about the black teacher scholar at work for you right now or at any point during this presentation? If the answer is yes, it is good that you have recognized you have a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Now you must think about solutions. For if you are ambivalent to the black teacher scholar, then what are the implications there for your black students, for example? To further subvert certain expectations during this session, Jennifer will speak on Shakespeare and I will speak on African-American literature at times. This is all deliberate. Thus, this is an opportunity to consider the intersections of our various identity markers and how they resonate with you as you listen. This critical race conversation is an opportunity for you to slow down and think about how race happens and to listen to yourself listening. This particular act, act one of our conversation, the exposition, it's designed to get you thinking about Shakespeare and race outside of the usual categories, namely the so-called race plays, as Ayanna Thompson has put it, and introduce you to some other ways of thinking. Okay, um, well, we are going to, to interview each other a little bit before before we move on to let you kind of into and have some insight into our practice. And I wanna ask you, David, um, colleague, in 2013, you first began consistently integrating Shakespeare and race in your teaching through a course that you created called Early Modern Literature, Crossing the Color Line. And this course is really, is really cool. Um, it combined, and you, you know, I think unique, and I hope after this talk, maybe, maybe less so combining the study of early modern English drama and African-American literature. Why did you create this course? Good question. So in 2013, I joined the faculty at Trinity College in Connecticut as the Ann Plato Predoctoral Fellow in English. Um, and Trinity's Educational Policy Committee made it very clear that they wanted me to create something that was um, innovative, at least for the curriculum at Trinity, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, and much like I do with my teaching now at Binghamton, I had ped pedagogical latitude at Trinity. And I reiterate that point because I know that teaching what I teach and how I want to teach it is a privilege of being at the kind of institution that we are at. Um, however, I'm also not naive to the fact that there are cases where instructors have that latitude but choose to perform helplessness and say that they don't have the time. So having studied at Trinity as an undergrad and remembering the experience that I had of being the only black student in my Shakespeare class, I worked backwards from that great but uncomfortable undergraduate experience. And I thought about how I could use my course description and syllabus structure to attract a diverse group of students. As I recalled that as an undergrad, my African-American literature and black women writers classes were much more diverse. And I imagine you probably see much more diversity in your classes than I do in my Shakespeare mm -hmm. class, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, how could I duplicate that and preemptively solve the racial homogeneity problem in my Trinity classroom as a teacher? This was a matter of marketing for the student audience I wanted. And so part of the answer was in combining the study of early modern English drama and African-American literature. And the other part was framing the course as one whose methodology integrated the personal, critical, and experiential pedagogical choices that led to 50% of my students being students of color. Beginning with the Du Boisian theory that could then be used to reread the early modern drama, crossing the color line, as the students call it for short, 
allowed the productive decentering of Shakespeare and white maleness through the syllabus's inclusion of black authors such as Paul Lawrence Dunbar, James Baldwin, Adrian Kennedy, June Jordan, Harriet Jacobs, Nella Larson, and others. So building from that, obviously whiteness matters in a course built around Shakespeare. How did, how did it whiteness factor in for you here? Yeah, uh, so it was a challenge, <laughs> I'll say that. Um, I knew in 2013 that whiteness, you know, it's a raced position, of course, there's no denying that, but my comfortability with discussing whiteness as a race position was not all there. And this took time to develop, especially because leading up to this moment, I really only heard one untrue message reiterated, that is, blackness equals race, which we know that's simply not true. Um, all people are race beings. And so additionally, I sensed that at the time, as Martha R. Mahoney aptly puts it in her essay, The Social Construction of Whiteness, in the logic of white privilege, making whites feel white equals racism. And now I certainly did not want to be accused of that. So I unfortunately allowed the power of whiteness to police me and my teaching a little back then. While white-centric plays like Hamlet and Christopher Marlowe's Edward II were included in my color line syllabus, class conversations about race and those plays might usually center on comparative conversations between, say, Edward II and Gaveston's intense homosocial bond and the homosexual relationship between David and Giovanni in Baldwin's Giovanni's room or even the homoeroticism in Nella Larson's passing. In other words, the chats oscillated between race and gender with students not really wanting to stay in the former category. And I find that often in the classroom to be the case that students are much more comfortable discussing gender and sexuality than, mm -hmm. or even the intersections of those things. Yes, me too, me too. Yet, especially because 2013 was the year that Black Lives Matter uh, movement began, following the 2012 murder of Trayvon Martin, my students were willing to identify Black tropes and stereotypes or call out the horrors of anti-Black racism and that enduring legacy, but by focusing mostly on the victims rather than the perpetrators. And in so doing, rendering whiteness unexamined and underexamined or even invisible. Um, so now on day one, as I think about things like white privilege and um, you know white guilt, I make it important that I demonstrate my comfortability with discussing race and particularly whiteness. And also I exude a genuine excitement about it, um, even though you know these conversations are difficult, much like the one that we're having right now. Okay, so talk to me about the this article here that's on the slide, the the piece and radical teacher called Crossing the Color Line. Um, why is it important that this kind of pedagogy that, that you talk about in this article be written about more and taken seriously by, by journals in the field? Yeah, so I'll answer this question pretty quickly using the lens of cultural psychology um, by drawing on the work of Canadian professor and psychologist Stephen J. Haina, who uses culture in reference to both information and groups of individuals. He asserts that cultures emerge from the interaction of various minds of the people that live within them, and cultures then in turn shape the way those minds operate. And he also argues that humans have prestige bias, which prompts us to imitate what others are doing and to be concerned with those who have the skills that are respected by others. Keeping all of this in mind, we can then think about the journals in Shakespeare studies as information repositories and culture shapers of the field what it values, what it deems most important or unimportant, and even whose work is respectable and should be respected. So the accepted authors too are culture shapers. If pedagogy scholarship is marginalized, for instance, and or not deemed as important as other kinds of scholarship, particularly in our flagship journals, this shapes how our minds treat such work. Moreover, if people do not have access to pedagogy scholarship through widely respected channels that could promote and amplify the work, teachers risk reinventing the wheel and they lose out on opportunities to build on or, or adapt others' ideas and time is wasted. But it's not the teachers who lose out the most here, it is of course the students. Speaking of students, you started out at Trinity and now you are here at Binghamton. How has your pedagogy evolved? since, you know, in that time? 
Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely involved a lot. Um, you know, for the first time, as I think about teaching it soon, um, the course is going to be taught online. For instance, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so there's a lot to consider as I think about how aware now my students are about racism and systemic oppression in ways that they weren't in the past. Um, because I think this pandemic has really helped put the spotlight on the fact that racism and these issues are everywhere under the rocks we never even thought we'd find it under. Um, and additionally, we're in a moment right now where the continued killing of uh, Black people by white people has extended this anti-Black racist brutality, um, this legacy of it that I, you know, called attention to in this course. And so I'm going to bring those things into the classroom um, because I know that the students, it's on their minds. Um, and I know that pedagogical evolution keeps things fresh. Uh, now, a more obvious answer to your question is that there is no one size fits all model to teaching. And so the students of yesterday are not the same as those of tomorrow. Uh, and thus the latter deserve to get, you know, an education that's current. And so that's, that's what I wanna give them. Mm -hmm. So leaning into act two, um, how, why did you ask me to join you in this talk? I'm sure if I asked Professor Stewart at UC Riverside, my undergrad Shakespeare teacher, if you imagine me presenting on Shakespeare in, in years into the future, he would probably say no. <laughs> so I would, <laughs> please tell us. Uh, so my short answer to that question, uh, actually I would do like a little treasure hunt here. Um, it's in your book. Uh, so everyone should really consider having this on your bookshelves. And it can be found in the Lena Horne epigraph on page 229, um, and also in the Rachel Gentile epigraph on page 277. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, you know, as a Shakespeare scholar who is heavily influenced by W.E.B. Du Bois's work and not just his color line theory, but also his concepts of the veil and double consciousness, mm -hmm. um, which have applicability in the Shakespeare canon and beyond it. I invited you because I was inspired by your work and I know that some of my colleagues are as well um, and, and how it opens up another dimension for us to think about race, um, particularly through sound. And so I've applied your work in my own, as I know others have. And moreover, like other Black thinkers and artists, such as James Baldwin, Susan Laurie Parks, Maya Angelou, for instance, Du Bois directly calls attention to Shakespeare and uses Shakespeare's pre-modern cultural capital to bolster his own statements um, in his text on global and uh, American racial politics. Um, and so with that in mind, Jennifer, you know, your work helped me understand that when I read Du Bois's words and when I encounter so much more in the world, I hear all that comprises Du Bois's blackness, the pain, the striving, the violence, the struggle, and even the hope. And on that note, a positive note of hope, let's transition into act two. So act two, of course, presents the rising action, the intensification of the matter at hand. And our act two uh, is, offers an aural flipping of the script where we're gonna move from the sound of a white woman's voice asking questions of a black man teaching Shakespeare and race to the sound of a black man's voice asking questions of a white woman teaching African-American studies and race. How does this role reversal sound to you? How might each interview amplify the other? How do they defy our expectations of these voices and any automatic authenticity or authority they signal? What also intensifies the action here is the introduction of a critical race theory toolkit that you can use to discuss race in your classroom, both in conjunction with Shakespeare and in terms of analyzing the classroom atmosphere itself. Okay, thank you for that introduction. So now I want to kind of dive into thinking about your work and, and your book. Um, you know, your introduction uh, to you, Owen mentioned that you taught high school for seven years before going to grad school. And what prompted you to become an academic, particularly studying race and sound? Ooh, well, that's a long road. I'm going to give you quick relevant details. Um, I taught high school in my hometown. I taught for six years, fresh out of college. Um, I am first and a half generation in college. I'm the first on my, my mother's side. I am, my, my dad went to community college army and finished up at Cal State Fullerton. I, I was really, really young. I love teaching high school. The students, as anyone will tell you, are the best part of the job. 
Um, and the classrooms in Riverside I taught of were more diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, religion, um, home language than any college classroom I have, have ever taught in. Um, I got an amazing, amazing education at UC Riverside, one of those educations that you know, changes your world. I graduated the same year, in fact, just a month after the uprisings in Los Angeles in 1992, only, only six, 60 miles, um, Riverside's only 60 miles from LA. So I went into to college like a lot of young white people right now with, with questions about my complicity in the racial system, how the racial system works, what is the racial system. And you know, I started and was able to, to, to begin that work at, at UC Riverside. So when I went into teaching high school, it also, I expected to be teaching students all of this material that we had been kind of, you know, essentially robbed of and lied to about in a lot of our public education. But I ended up continuing to learn a whole lot about structural racism in the classroom. And you know, I was also an, an avid teacher, which meant that I was an advocate for students underrepresented in college to help them you know complete their requirements the high school i taught at guidance counselors 600 um 600 students to one counselor so um people were falling through the cracks um and especially students of color who are first gen to go to college but in that becoming an advocate for these students and helping them with their classes is also you know they're getting kicked out of of classes for for being noisy or loud when they come to me. Ms. Stover, I'm just working on the work. Like what, what's happening? Um, and Kennedy Johnson, uh, a PhD student at Bloomington is doing a lot of work on um, black girls in the, in the secondary classroom right now, great project. And so I was seeing that firsthand and going through that. And then in, I talk about this a little bit in the acknowledgement to the book in um, 1997, uh, Close, a close, someone close to me, James Martinez, was shot in the back um, by the crash gang unit um, in, in Home Gardens, California. And less than a year later, um, Taisha Miller, one of the first students in the high school class, my very first class I ever taught, was killed by Riverside police, shot 12 times as she was passed out in her car just about a mile from, from my parents. Um, and those those murders were devastating and upsetting and on an unsettling on a deep level. And I felt really powerless as as an individual in the classroom and going to graduate school, particularly studying race and ethnicity at USC. Their program was started after the 1992 um, the 92 uprisings. And that was where I wanted to be. I wanted to understand. I wanted to enact change on a, a deep systemic level. So that's partly how I ended up, you know, going to graduate school. I actually went to study representations of students of color in public school. The, the example from the reading, Du Bois, um, when the, the white girl turns away his, his visiting card, that was one of the, the, the scenes that I talked about in my grad school application. And when I got there and began studying music um, as well and popular culture and uh, taking uh, Tiang for a course called Black Popular Culture with Judith Jackson Fawcett that opened my world to thinking about um, this question about sound and in and, and, and connection with with race in this way. Nice. And so you, you mentioned, you know, the word power and powerlessness. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to absorb a lot of power from Du Bois. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about how his work influenced you um, and, and also how you build on his concept of the color line in your book, The Sonic Color Line. Du Bois is one of the foremost intellectuals of, in, of United States history. And reading him, I read him the first time at UC Riverside and I've just read him, you know, tens of, of, of uh, times over and over again. And what I appreciate about Du Bois is in laying out the color line, right? He changes that terminology from thinking about race as um, what well, in the parlance of the 19th century was the Negro problem. He puts race um, both onto whiteness and white supremacy and this idea or ideologies of white supremacy, I should say and putting it on the color line that the problem is the designation itself, the hierarchies, the system. And so pointing us toward that um, is very important. Also the way that he thinks about music and the way that those bars of music at, you know, which he puts, we wanted to make sure we gave a link to a version that has those bars of music there. Those are 
uh, transcriptions into European notation of what he called the sorrow songs of black, um, black enslaved people's um, co traditional culture. And the way that he thinks about sound as both opening up a form of empowerment, even as he recognizes that the ways in which his own voice will be silenced, even as he's speaking the truth, was was very um, was very profound to me, and this idea that we can be co-workers in the kingdom of culture, right? That we can, that that uh, the goal, this American kind of melting pot that that we're fed, um, especially in in a lot of our public education, it doesn't have to be that the assimilation is not a a one way street into kind of white Americanism. That we're still working out each and every day what America is who Americans are was, was also very powerful to me. And I saw sound as a way that that's being kind of being, being worked out. And so I build from both his notion in the souls of black folk that, that sound is important to, um, to us culturally, that we hear things differently. Um, and in part that's because of, of how race works on our daily. And that's the other thing is that a lot of white people don't understand, I think the deep you know, double consciousness and the kind of way that race works on on one on, on one's psyche, one's emotions, one sense of the world, one sense of safety, and you know that's why this argument, like, oh, you know, segregation's over there. You know, th there's no legal racism, right? And so Du Bois is showing all of these ways that that it still exists and proliferates, which is a question that I very much had going into, you know college, teaching, grad school, et cetera. Um, and he changes his mind. You know, that's the other thing is he's, he's, he's so nimble as a thinker that by 1940, you know, he's like, forget the veil. People can't hear. We have a plate glass window in front of us, you know, and he, you know, but that is also, I think for me, an important, um, a, an important thing to, to um, aspire to is constantly learning, speaking, fearlessly and changing your mind when, you know, I won't say even, all, you know, when new evidence arises, charting a different course and going after it. Um, so, so he inspires me both, you know, in my, in my way of being, as well as in how I think about sound and race. So yeah, I owe him, I owe him everything. So do I. <laughs> I'm re I, I agree with you um, in terms of just how inspiring and, and I feel like also too, Every time I read the souls of black folk, there's it just hits me from a different angle. Um, so it's another one of those works that moves really well with the times. And you know, thinking about the times and times yeah. changing, and of course the way that your uh, ideology adjusts and augments how we think about the color line. You have this concept that you work with of the listening ear, which we've defined on the slide. Um, yeah. You can talk about. What is it? Just, you know, what is it? How does it work? And also, how is it connected to the notion of the soundscape? Well, you know, I mentioned Du Bois having this image in the 40s of, uh, of the color line now, not as this visual kind of veil, this visual image, um, where he says, you know, you can hear me. You may not be able to see who I really am. You've created this, this illusion and projected stereotype and fantasy onto my visuality, but you can hear me. And by 1940, when World War II starts, he's like, no, there's something happening. You cannot hear me. You're not hearing. I am, he says, I'm screaming in a vacuum unheard. Um, so both the image of losing air, um, not being able to breathe, and that, that image of that glass. And so the listening ear is like that clear glass and part of my job as a teacher and as a, as a person out in the world is helping, um, helping people to understand how that, to, to see and feel and hear that clear glass so we can figure out how to break through it. So the listening ear is an ideological filter that is shaped in relation to the sonic color line. It's that, that judgmental like, oh, this is how a class should sound. Mm -hmm. It should sound quiet because that signals students are working. Um, that that Americans should speak English, that it's that should, right? That we have all these complex experiences of sound and how it works and what we think, but then we, we narrow it. Um, uh, 
Uh, and also the notion that, right, certain neighborhoods, this is where soundscape builds in, right, that, that white suburban neighborhoods are, are quiet, whereas black neighborhoods or neighborhoods of uh, people of color are loud. And it's these binary elements of race that, you know, after the civil rights movement became, um, you know, taboo uh, to, to kind of, you know, well, until recently, um, to be for white people to be overtly racist in public, sound was a, a code, and this idea of the listening ear became a code. It's not that um, you know we don't hire black people here; it's that you don't speak properly on the on the telephone at this job. You you don't sound professional, and so these 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 terms. Um, oh, you don't want to live in that neighborhood; it's noisy. Um, and so I noticed that sound was operating in these covert ways. And, and John Bach calls it linguistic pro profiling. Um, and also I'm building, I should say I'm building on the scholarship of Fred Moten, who was on my committee, Judith Jackson Fawcett, who's also on my committee, um, you know, Krista Mariah, Jonathan Stern, Carter Mathis, Eric Porter, like all these folks, Pris Priscilla Peña Ovalle, all these folks that are calling attention to the social construction of race. And so it's not just music, it's not just voice, but it's also our expectations of how the world should sound. You know, it's when, um, it, you know, it's when the idea that, um, you know, a white man gets to tell um, everyone at the, the gas station whose music is too loud and what music should be played there, you know. Michael Dunn, um, you know, shooting and killing Jordan Davis for that reason. That's, that's how listening ear works in the soundscape. And what is the soundscape, just for folks? Oh, so those are the sounds, you, the ambient sounds you hear in a particular location. You know, one of the exercises I do with my students is I have them list the soundscape of the classroom on the board. And then we talk about the hierarchies that are in there. We, I mean, it's everything from, you know, the sound of pencils scratching to the hum of the air conditioner to the professor's voice. And then we rank them in order of importance. I'm like, well, what's the sound that's most important in this room? And, and inevitably they'll say the professor's voice <laughs> and they have this all the way listed down. And so we're trained to, to index sounds. You know, we act like all this comes at us, but we, these filters shape, you know, how we're, how we're listening. And inevitably, my students never mention their own voices. And that's one thing, by the time student get, students get to college, they're trained to, to not hear or treat as irrelevant each other's voices. Mm. Um, and, you know, we're trying to have these deep conversations, but, you know, they're already trained to tune that out from each other. And so a lot of our work today is going to be how to, how to undo that. So that's how Soundscape works. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, and you know what you say about voices, I hadn't really ever thought about it in that way, just in terms of how students are trained in a certain way to think about how to use their voices in certain spaces and, and what that can mean. Um, and I guess that actually gives a nice segue into Act 3, where we're going to talk about uh, Shakespeare and the racialized sound of masculinity and authority. So. For us in this act structure, act three is our turning point in this conversation as we shift the focus directly onto Shakespeare. And on this slide, we have two very different images of Shakespeare. One we might consider a pre-modern reflection on the left and one on the right that is more modern. While both images are powerful in their centering of whiteness and masculinity, they do so quite differently. For me, for example, the pre-modern Shakespeare with his early modern attire evokes a classic traditional authority, whereas the more modern, cool looking, tatted up Shakespeare, whose pose mimics and appropriates the b-boy stance that originated with hip hop culture, conveys a sense of authority that is much less intimidating than the image on the right, despite both images being of the same white man. In either image, authority is gendered and it is also racialized. Depending on who you are, you may be more intimidated by the Shakespeare image on the right. Is it his tattoos, his sartorial pre-modern departure, or perhaps it's his black racial signifying that makes him too much like or unlike whatever your mythical idea of Shakespeare is. The varied responses that people will have to the visual power of these two different images reflects what can also occur in the classroom with respect to how students respond to and engage with pedagogical authority figures 
who differ in many ways, especially with respect to race for the purposes of our conversation. And since the classroom is a space of mutual engagement, it goes without saying that instructors should be attentive to how they respond to students' different racial backgrounds as well. For in those responses, as we allude to at the beginning of our talk, lessons are being taught consciously or unconsciously about race and power. And sometimes when one does this without care, such lessons are harmful and constitute what might be considered pedagogical malpractice because they participate in the structuring of racial inequality. Mm -hmm. To quote Ruben Espinosa from his article, Diversifying Shakespeare, to foster a classroom atmosphere where students can be confident makers of Shakespeare, where they do not see their background, language, or cultural heritage as an obstacle to understanding Shakespeare, but instead as an asset is essential. Yeah. If Othello and the Merchant of Venice are the only moments in a course when race enters the conversation, consider who that helps and harms. For as Joyce Mean Green MacDonald puts it, to produce the non-white alien is thus implicitly and often explicitly to produce a white early modern self. With that in mind, it is misguided to think that a play alone can teach race. Othello and Merchant alone cannot teach race. Teaching is the teacher's job. So we're gonna talk a bit here about power and empowerment. You know, who has the power in the classroom? Who is empowered? And I mentioned a little bit earlier about one of the things that Du Bois did was to change the terms of the debate um, about race. And for close readers out there, Easter egg, right? He likens the issue of race in America to Banquo's ghost from Macbeth, um, invisible, but only due to the, invisible only because of the suppression of a guilty conscience. He says, in vain do we cry this to our vastest social problem. Take any shape but that, and my firm nerve shall never tremble. Um, so in, you know, to change the terms of the debate, right? So he says, you know, it's the color line. Black people are not the problem. The hierarchy is the problem. He even hyphenated color line so that color could never be broken off from line, that it's never color that's the problem. It's its attachment to this line. And that's something I fought with my book press about that hyphen. I, I lost, as you can tell, but um, I really, you know, I, I do that in my own practice. Um, Black people's presence is not the problem. White people's racial hierarchy isn't the problem. And this holds true in our classrooms today from K through 12 to, to higher education. And so how does power in the classroom work? You know, um, one of the things we, we didn't talk about um, in our Q&A, we didn't get a chance to, was about you know, my whiteness in the classroom, teaching African-American studies and thinking about, you know, what does it mean uh, for, for me to, to, to be teaching about race and literature in that context. Um, and one of the things I, I try, um, or I always enact as a practice from day one is calling attention to that unearned authority and that I don't expect it. Um, that, you know, and it's easy for me to say and to perform it, but I do several things with my students, including, you know, helping all of us, giving students an opportunity to set the agenda in, in my classroom. I talk to them and I tell them I'm vulnerable with them. I allow them to ask me any questions they have because inevitably black and white students and, and students of color are curious as to how I wow. came to study what I study, right? Because it isn't the, the norm. And also if I know, you know, if I know what I know, but I know that, you know, I'm, I'm open to, I'm not only open to those questions, I'm welcoming to them because I, I recognize, you know, systemically what's going on and, and why, why this is so. Um, so. So that's one thing that, you know, I even have them email me, you know, they do a formal email as their first assignment. I ask, hey, is there anything you want to know about me as a professor? I make it optional. And I always answer those questions in class fully, completely, um, you know, it's important. When I worked with Judith Jackson Fawcett, she modeled this for me. Um, she talked to the class about, you know, I'm a black professor, I have a white TA, like what did you all think when you walked into class? And 
um, one of the students in class, um, a, a black woman said, you know, I was like, ah, eh, she's probably gonna know about hip hop and slavery, but that's it. Um, and she's, you know, pleasantly surprised me that, um, and that's what I want. Like I want to earn, I want to earn authority through the knowledge that I offer. And I build that knowledge in conjunction with my students, you know, and I always have students presenting. I have students at the second half of the semester opening the class and all of my lectures are built in response to what the students are leading with. Um, I, I open up our classroom to black critical voices, right? I'm only one voice in this, this network. And I talk about my own scholarly lineage, not as a flex, but as, um, you know, that I've learned from black and white scholars, you know, in my, in my quest, um, you know, Catherine Kinney, Fred Moten, Judith Jackson Fawcett, Carla Kaplan, Cynthia Young, um, you know, and I, and I talk about that and what they gave me and I bring all those voices into the classroom. And I do a lot with students, you know, I make sure those first few days that I bring student voices into the classroom as well. And I fill it with the sounds of, of all of our voices. And it's imperfect, and, but I'm open to that dialogue every single day of the semester. I think that's so important, um, that recognition of all of the student voices. Um, that's yeah. something that's really important for me too. And so I, it, it's kind of a mission that I make for myself. Um, you know, by a certain point in a semester, I don't care if it's a 50 person classroom, I need every student to say something yes. before that they need to be involved in the class discussion. And if they're not, I do offer other ways for them to do that, you know, online or having dialogues with me. But I think it's so important. It's not their, you know, oral voice. At the very least, I'm mm -hmm. hearing their writerly voices because they're communicating with me in that way. And I think, you know, it seems like we have, we have a lot in common and we've talked about this um, in terms of our teaching approaches. Uh, but one of the things that I, I think is the, the biggest commonality, and I think it's so important because it made all the difference for me as an undergraduate student, um, is just that approachability aspect. Um, you know, the professor for me was yeah. kind of a scary figure. And depending on the race of the professor, it, one might be more scary than the other. So it, it really, um, you know, makes it important to break down that barrier. Um, I went to office hours in undergrad exactly one time and only because the professor, and it was Catherine Kinney, wrote, please see me during office hours on my paper. And I'm making <laughs> a habit to do that myself every semester and write, please come see me. And not in a, it wasn't a threatening, it was like, come see me to talk about, have you thought about grad school, it said. Yeah. Um, to think about how that small, and I hadn't, um, I didn't even know what grad school was. And so for her to, to do that, I mean, it's why I'm here. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. small moments can mean so much. Um, I think on that note, we probably need to transition into our intermission. Yes, it's time to, to stretch a little bit. So as you continue thinking about race, sound, gender, authority, and all that we've explored thus far, we're gonna have a brief intermission to pause our black and white voices and introduce some new voices into the conversation. We're gonna show two video clips. The first is really short, so you gotta like pay attention right on the jump. And the second is about four minutes. If the visuals do not appear completely clear on your end, I'm sorry, we're all familiar with this Zoom issue. Um, it's okay, we actually just want you to focus on what you hear. Um, and you should know that our intermission and act four are being shared with you as pedagogical tools that you can use in your own classrooms if you like. So here we're gonna start off with a very short clip um, from Boots Riley's 2018, Sorry to Bother You. And it's, it is a whole entire, entire mood, this movie. Um, but I'm gonna say really quickly, among the many things that this film does is trace the daily life of Cassius Green, a black man in his 20s in Oakland, played by Lakeith Stanfield, who's also from Riverside. Um, who's, he's, also, he's trying to get a job in this film and get out of his uncle's garage. And he gets a job telemarketing at a company that's very symbolically named Regal View. Um, and he's had a terrible first few days. And here in this clip, his coworker, played by Danny Glover, encourages him to use his white voice on the phone to become a power caller. Um, the film delves into whiteness as a performance for white people, um, not just 
you know, not just this kind of imposed sound for people of color, but white people perform whiteness too. And that's exactly what, you know, we're getting at an aspirational, empowered, desirable sound. And it is one that is as much of a fantasy as white people's imaginings of, of black sound. Regal View isn't selling encyclopedias so much as it's selling all, all that comes attached to this white voice. So here we go. Hey, young blood, let me give you a tip. Use your white voice. Man, I ain't got no white voice. Oh, come on, you know what I mean. You have a white voice in there, you can use it. It's like being pulled over by the police. Oh, no, I just use my regular voice when that happens. I just say, back the fuck up off the car and don't nobody get out. All right, man, I'm just trying to give you some game. Uh, you want to make some money here? Uh, then read the script with a white voice. When people say I talk with a white voice anyway, so why ain't it helping me out? Well, you don't talk white enough. I'm not talking about Will Smith's wife. I'm talking about the real deal, like this young blood. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is Langston from Regal View. I didn't catch you at the wrong time, did I? Hey, hey young blood. Thank you for that. And now we're going to uh, transition into listening to white sound and the white voice. So for part two of this audio visual intermission, we're gonna offer a brief clip of a stage production of Macbeth. And this clip corresponds with much of the language from act four, scene three in the drama, in case you'd like to take a look at that language. By this point in the play, Macbeth has killed his king, Duncan, and assumed the Scottish throne. And Duncan's two sons, Malcolm and Donaldane, have fled the country for their safety. Upon reuniting in England with Macduff, a thane who also flees Scotland and regretfully leaves his wife and children behind, regretfully because they end up getting murdered, Malcolm tests Macduff's loyalty to their country in order to determine if he can trust his fellow Scottish man. Malcolm does this by suggesting he is full of vices and is himself not fit to be king and undo evil Macbeth. As you reflect on the white voice, the performative white male voice that the Boots Riley film satirically highlighted, pay attention to what you notice about the white voice in this scene and the words that voice speaks, as you will likely come to some of the same conclusions that Jennifer and I have about what is going on with racialized sound. Mm -hmm. Suffer and more sundry ways than ever by him that shall succeed. What should he be? It is myself, I mean, in whom I know all the particulars of vice so grafted that when they shall be opened, black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow, <laughs> and the poor state esteem him as a lamb being compared with my confineless harms. Not in the legions of horrid hell can come a devil more damned in evils to top Macbeth. I grant him bloody. Luxurious, avaricious, false, deceitful, sudden, malicious, smacking of every sin that has a name. But there's no bottom, none, in my voluptuousness. Your wives, your daughters, your matrons, and your maids could not fill up the cistern of my lust <coughs> and my desire. All continent impediments would all bear that did oppose my will. Better Macbeth than such a one to reign. Boundless intemperance in nature is a tyranny. It has been the untimely emptying of the happy throne and fall of many kings. Yet. Do not fear to take upon you what is yours. You may convey your pleasures in a spacious plenty. We have willing dames enough. <laughs> there cannot be that vulture in you to devour so many as will to greatness dedicate themselves, finding it so inclined. With this there grows in my most ill-composed affection such a staunchless avarice that were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels and this other's house, and my more having would be as a sauce to make me hunger more, that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. This avarice sticks deeper, grows with more pernicious root than summer-seeming lust, and it hath been the sword of our slain kings. 
Yet, do not fear. Scotland hath wealth enough to fill up your will. All these are portable, with other graces weighed. But I have none. <sighs> the king becoming graces as justice, verity, temperance, stableness, bounty, perseverance, mercy, lowliness, devotion, patience, courage, fortitude. I have no relish of them, but abound in the division of each several crime, acting it many ways. Nay, had I power, I should pour the sweet milk of concord into hell, uproar the universal peace, confound all unity on earth. Oh, Scotland. Scotland. If such a one be fit to govern, speak. I am, as I have spoken, fit to govern. No, not to live. O oh, nation miserable, with an untitled tyrant, bloody sceptred, when shalt thou see thy wholesome days again, since that the truest issue of thy throne by his own interdiction stands accursed? These evils thou repeatest upon thyself have banished me from Scotland. Oh, my breast. Thy hope ends here. Let off! This noble passion, child of integrity, hath from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts. All right, and we'll stop it there with black scruples, and, but you get the point of what's going on in this scene. So for act four, of our presentation, we turn explicitly to the falling action in Macbeth and an excerpt from Act 4, Scene 3. In a Binghamton graduate course, I had my students do a critical race scene isolation that asked them to close read specific all white scenes like the wooing scene in Richard III while using our theoretical race studies tools to examine all that is racialized about the dialogue. And with some modifications, this is an easy exercise that could work well at the undergraduate and even high school levels. This particular Macbeth scene, Act 4, Scene 3, which I critique in an essay that will appear in Volume 50 of a forthcoming Shakespeare Studies Forum, co-edited by me, Patricia Akimi, and Arthur Little, uses the negative trope of blackness to make a critical racialized statement about black Macbeth, whose blackness is metaphorical or emblematic rather than somatic. Black Macbeth appears akin to the barbarian figure Ian Smith writes about in Race and Rhetoric in the Renaissance. This figure, he argues, is characterized as threatening and destructive to good social institutions, aggressive and politically dangerous to the survival of the state, corrupt and thus harmful to the assumed purity of the body politic, and deficient and different, and therefore destined to undermine every cultural tradition. Indeed, Macbeth lives up to all this symbolic blackness he exudes. And in her incredibly generative 1996 Shakespeare quarterly article, Beauty and the Beast of Whiteness, Teaching Race and Gender, Kim Hall reminds us that the difference between textual blackness and black people is fundamentally important. And as a side note for those watching this before July 31st, 2020, Hall's article is available for free download until the end of this month. Simply Google it and you'll be able to download it. Now, speaking of real black people, I do want to direct attention to the image on the screen of Ira Aldridge, a stage actor who played Macbeth in the 19th century of, in Scotland. In addition to discussing race through the language of Macbeth, instructors can add positivity to the play's stereotypical black is bad narrative by discussing the rich professional history of an actual black actor like Aldridge, a history that is, of course, wedded to race and racism. In addition to Wayward Macbeth, the edited collection by Scott Newstock and Ayanna Thompson, we mentioned previously, you can learn more about Ira Aldridge in Clifford Mason's more recent Macbeth in Harlem, Black Theater in American from the Beginning to a Raisin in the Sun. But it isn't just the overt references to blackness um, that that um, David just just analyzed for us. It's also the soundscape, and I will talk briefly here about you know the, testing the theory of how the sonic color line works and how race 
um, in this time period, particularly ideas, European ideas about race, particularly in connection to imperialism, the enslavement of, of Africans, um, and you know, building the so-called new world of the Western Atlantic, you know, they're using sound to, to work out and build race. And, and Shakespeare uses sound in this play to evoke ideas about race. They're not just sound effects um, as we might think of them now, especially the thunder, the thunder and the way that the thunder in the play and is associated with the witches and that space of the, um, the wilderness, right? And it's this, this hierarchical border, a sonic color line being built between white civilization and this dark and tempting wilderness and wildness. Um, thunder's out of the control of humans. It's louder than any sound at the time human beings could make. It, it's the sound of this wild and unruly space of the forest. And, you know, the word hurricane and comes into the English lexicon in 1555 in direct reference to the Caribbean. So thunder is is quite quite literally imagined in this in this new space. And thunder, you'll note, also opens the Tempest, which is um, more obviously one of Shakespeare's race plays. And the fact that Macbeth comes first and kind of Tempest harkens back, I think, is is really really critical. So the thunder in this play is this uncultivated space, right? The space of the, the not godly that draws Macbeth. It's raced and gendered by the witches and who are literally beyond order. Um, they need to be called into order. And a lot of um, some great work by um, Richard Cullenrath is an ethnic studies scholar at the University of Hawaii. He wrote a great book called How Early America Sounded. And it's greatly informing our reading here. And essentially it's how England interpreted sound and what kind of gets pulled, white England and what gets pulled into and kind of takes root here in, um, here in the, you know, in early America. So bells are actually kind of the sound of order. And we see bells here throughout the play, alarm bells. Bells are associated with Lady Macbeth, who is right, usurping power. Um, she here Here's the bells as an owl's shriek or a hideous trumpet. So she's hearing these bells, you know, and, and she can't kind of assume the power of the bells. Um, she can't even hear them that way. They had real official power. Bells were the sign of a godly community um, set as the opposite of the thunder. So opposite that many church bells at this point were still engraved with Latin phrases like fulgura frango, um, I subdue the thunderbolt. Um, so ringing the bells was thought to stop thunder and the damage that thunder was, was thought to cause. And the bell extends the power of rulers beyond the human voice. Um, you know, and again, when Lady Macbeth, she tries to usurp that power, she calls that bell the, the knell that summons Duncan to heaven or to hell. Um, and so that, that's really critical, that interplay between the bell and, and the thunder in this play and the way that the thunder is also bringing in the other and the, the, the temptation, the danger of the other and really comparing it to and kind of hierarchizing it below the sounds of the order of the court. And this whole play is about the restoration of the order of the court, right? Yes, and along with that too, you know, the, the animal sounds are signs of uh, nature re reflecting Scotland's socio-political chaos and disorder, and also the racial chaos as well. Um, Macbeth fails to be an ideal white man in that he is not good, and also because his manliness is deficient as Lady Macbeth's rhetorical critiques of her husband's manhood confirm. Macbeth cannot white the black scruples from his damaged soul like Malcolm can and quickly does in act four, scene three. And the power of whiteness that Macbeth lacks is embedded in the trumpets and drums um, initially used around the presence of King Duncan mm -hmm. as sound markers of class, royalty, and also race, his kingly whiteness. And thus they are linked to the play's racial politics. And the battle sounds toward the play's end are representative of the fight between good and evil, or more locally between Macduff and Black Macbeth, mm -hmm. representing a common racialized early modern trope of blackness, the kinds that Kim Hall calls attention to in Things of Darkness, Macbeth is depicted as devilish, a treasonous enemy. 
who must be purged in Act Five in order for Scotland's restoration to be possible under its new king, Malcolm, whom you saw go through his own quick transformation in the clip we showed for the recorded Folger performance. Yeah, it's really amazing that one second he's like, I'm terrible, I'm trash, I'm actually worse than Macbeth, to the point of like, there was laughter in that clip, you know, everyone was laughing at his description of himself as voluptuous, right? So it's raced and gendered, the intersection there. Informative, too. Yes, but then all of a sudden he's like, you know, we need you. And uh, then Malcolm suddenly like kind of inhabits, right, that, that, that white voice that we saw in the clip. He, he ascends to good through this conversion experience. And the last sound of the play is that flourishing of the trumpet. Malcolm is heralded as a new and rightful and just King of Scotland. Bruce Smith talks about this as Shakespeare's bid for unisonance, that there's some kind of resolving sound at the end. So, you know, this is the this is an acoustic closure here. It's the sound of that good version of white European masculinity taking control. It opened in thunder, but now we have that that royal flourish at the ends. Yeah. So essentially, far. yeah. They make it through the wilderness um, in this play. And they get rid of blackness, which is also one of their goals. Um, so moving on to our final act, act five, um, we are concluding by putting more of the uncomfortable on the table. And that is the reality that we are living in unprecedented times right now and that the teaching season for many is fast approaching. We begin our uh, act right now with a quotation from Macbeth when Macbeth becomes pale with fear, it becomes blanched with fear when he sees the ghost of the murdered Banquo, a ghost that none of his present guests nor his wife can see. As Jennifer suggested earlier when she acknowledged Du Bois' reference to this scene, race and racism in particular share commonalities with the ghost of Banquo in a figurative sense. They can be uncomfortable to confront, but they have to be confronted. As such, we've included at the bottom of this slide an image that contains some helpful popular books on race, racism, and anti-racism. And so I hope you'll either jot them down now or come back to them. Um, and as we close out this session, we want you to know that incorporating critical race theory into the classroom does not have to be scary or intimidating, but it does need to happen and it must be done with care. So now what we'd like to do as we close out before we get to the questions that we received is yeah. help you by offering uh, some day one strategies that we use. So this is yet another tool um, that you can come back to and reference. Um, but as you prepare for the start of your semester or the start of your school year, whether it's elementary, middle school or, or high school, mm -hmm. these are some things that we hope will help you. First, um, make sure you see critical race studies engagement as an exciting opportunity and, and not a burden and you communicate that to students. I think one of the things that, you know, the students can tell I'm enthusiastic and passionate about African American literature, about the conversations we're having in class. And that actually is often what, what helps them open up the most is when they see and feel my own investment and, and desire um, and to have these conversations and to create a space where these kind of conversations can happen. Um, so make sure that that is part of how you approach it. Um, make sure you define your terms, race, racism, anti-racism, bias, prejudice, like these things, you know, work them out, um, what they mean colloquial, colloquially, what, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore has, has some great work in writing on, on defining racism. Like find those things, bring them into your class, talk about those terms. Know your students. I think the other thing I do to communicate um, that I come to class um, you know, humble and aware of um, this kind of, you know, both lack of authenticity in a racialized world, but also this unearned power is, is by listening and talking about and presenting myself as a listener and that listening is the most important thing I'm gonna do in that room that semester. 
Um, you know, make sure you, you learn students' names. And actually one thing I do to, to get everyone talking that first day is I have students go around the room and pronounce their names and I reply to them and pronounce it. And I say, don't stop until I get your name correctly, how you want to be called, how you, who you answer to. And I, I, I go through that process um, of, of perf, you, know, you know, literally pronouncing their names, getting names right is so important. Um, so I bring, that, I bring that into the classroom as well. And they know that, that I want to work till I get it right. And I perform that for them too. Um, it's important, that's, that's who you are. Um, maintain awareness about how race matters with respect to face-to-face -face versus distance learning, digital racism, things like trolling. Um, we've all unfortunately experienced it um, and it can be very, very traumatic. Um, and also thinking about, you know, you know, well, there's a lot out there and we can share some resources on, on how this may change when you're not physically, um, physically in the room. Um, also avoiding performative helplessness, not going, ah, oh, I can't talk about this. White people know a lot about race, right? I talk about that in my book. We've been listening to white people talk our whole lives. We've been watching and hearing white people. That's how we learn that white voice is by, by watching and learning. And so, 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 so don't, you know, everyone, performs race, everyone hears race from a very different perspective and teasing out those different perspectives is key. You also want to avoid performative wokeness um, and turning, I don't, I don't, I don't turn, you know, I tell the students a little bit about myself, but not so it becomes about, the class becomes about me and my kind of, you know, my experience and centralizing that. It's again, to show them where I'm coming from, but you know, like, like um, our colleagues expressed so well last week from Bell Hooks' works, don't expect a cookie um, for doing this. This is just good teaching. You know, this is just good, good humanness and performative allyship. You know, I always, I say what I mean. I, you know, my word is my bond and that's how I walk it like I talk it. And that, that's really the, the thing that students hear. Um, I think so make sure that that you're on point and and kind of constantly asking yourself questions and, and reflecting on yourself all the time. Um, I think that's so apt because students they sense everything. Um, so oh, yeah. they sense our fear, um, but they can also sense when we're not sincere and when we're being disingenuous. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to take seriously the roles that we have in their lives. Um, in addition to the things that Jennifer mentioned, you know, can't stress this enough. Um, some of you who follow me on Twitter, you probably see me tweeting about this incessantly, but we are dealing with um, a public health disaster at the moment um, with unprecedented challenges due to COVID-19. And because of that, you know, mixed with the conflation of the protests that are happening, um, we're, we're seeing in increases um, as if it wasn't enough already in instances of racism um, and anti-Semitism um, and just general racial unrest and also sexism and the list goes on. And so between now and whenever it is that you're going to start teaching, um, anticipate and, and just sit down and think about what this all is going to mean for, for you in terms of what your students in addition to you are going to be dealing with and, and what you're going to bring and what they are going to bring in the classroom and how can you make that work for you rather than you having to work against it because it is this kind of oppositional force. Um, that's something that I really try to do in my teaching is, is make the world around me work for me um, because it's there and Students are only spending 85 minutes in my classroom, so they're going back out into that work that is a uh, world that is doing far more work than I'm doing for them in 85 minutes. I um, also want to stress, Jenny, Jennifer and I, practicing patience and humility with yourself and your students. Um, you know, people are people, and especially right now, because times are so trying, um, people may get sick, uh, people may not understand certain concepts, people may have general fears with respect to discussing race in the classroom. I think it's also important to consider that as much as students might have fears, and typically I find that with my white students, students also have trauma. 
Um, and even I, as a black male professor living in this moment, have trauma that I have to manage and deal with. And so as much as you can put yourself in your student's shoes and, and be sensitive to those things, um, that can really go a long way, uh, particularly from day one. If you make your students aware that this is how you operate um, and, and this is who you are and this is how you're presenting your pedagogy and also how you're defining your professional relationship with them. Mm -hmm. uh, now, since we had uh, the previous quotation up from Macbeth, blanched with fear, uh, we're switching over now to The Tempest here um, and thinking about Caliban's language of, of be not afeared. Um, you know, this work, as we keep reiterating, it's hard. It's not something that can be done overnight. And while even if you find our critical race session useful or any of the others that you're going to, to watch, um, you're not necessarily gonna get it just by having this moment. And so in addition to practicing patience and humility with yourself, um, recognize that as you do this work, particularly if you're not accustomed to doing this work, and even if you are, mistakes will and can happen. Um, and the important thing to do is acknowledge those mistakes when they happen, um, you know, don't get flustered and use them as teaching moments and teaching opportunities. Um, that's what I try to do in my classroom mm -hmm. is make everything, even the stuff that, you know, comes down to maybe dealing with classroom management issues, try to turn it into a teaching opportunity. Um, and if there's a way for me to connect it to the literature, I do that as well. Uh, second to last, you know, improvisation, uh, as Jennifer and I talk about performativity, uh, for both of us, teaching, uh, you know, when we're in our classroom, um, is pretty performative. I think by, by nature, I would consider myself somewhat of an introvert. And so when I get in the classroom, I come alive. And that excitement that I have about this work, I really try to exude that for my students. But sometimes it's hard. Um, you know, again, we've got the pandemic that we're dealing with right now. At times, we've had to deal with student deaths in our department. Um, and, and two, you know, within a very short period of time. And that really changed the ethos of the campus. And uh, so there was some course correcting that I needed to do because I couldn't work with my students in the way that I was before their morning set in. Mm -hmm. um, there was also an instance uh, near our, our campus or in this town of Binghamton, you know, where someone had painted swastikas on the streets um, and, and that, we have a significant Jewish student population at Binghamton. So I recognize that. And I came to class not prepared that day to talk about the Merchant of Venice or use Shylock's language, his beautiful speech, that is an empowering speech to, to have my class discussion. But I felt like I needed to at least start there, even though that wasn't on my agenda. So know that it's okay to improvise and that you can course correct too. Um, if the term doesn't seem to be going so well with the race work that you've chosen to put together with your Shakespeare plays or, it, you know, you can course correct, you can change course and, and try something different. Um, and I think in that sense too, taking advantage of different networks and getting advice from people is also important. And the last thing that Jennifer and I want to stress, um, which is really the whole point of these first two instances in the Critical Race Conversation series that the Folger has, is stay student-centered with your pedagogy, um, you know, which can and should have synergy with the personal, critical, and experiential. And on that note, we are going to turn quickly um, to the questions that we received and um, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can before we turn it over to Owen. There we go. Okay, which one do you do you want to, to so, talk about first? Oh, well, I'll take the, the first one. So we received a question. By the way. Uh, sorry. Oh, I was just thanking everyone for the questions. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. These questions are, are great. Um, do you think that the study of the sonic color line in Shakespeare has anything to say to the work of Ian Smith on barbarous African tongues, Patricia Parker on English dialects in the history plays, or even the work of Bruce Smith on sound in the theater? And so to that, I'll just say, you know, um, we certainly do. Um, you know, we we leaned on or cited, referenced uh, Ian Smith earlier in this talk and also Bruce Smith um, engaged with his work. So read all of this work um, and you should read other work as well. 
and make that work work together in the classroom. And, you know, since Ian Smith's uh, book was mentioned, which um, also another one that you should think about having, um, let me just take this opportunity to say that the field uh, and even responses to the complexity of this field have yet to really fully appreciate the complexity of race scholars work, um, which often gets reduced to race, um, even though important interventions that they make rely on intersections with other matters like rhetoric, for instance, in Ian's case, or religion and romance in the case of Dennis Britton uh, in his book, Becoming Christian, Race, Reformation and Early Modern English Renaissance Romance. And so um, it's important that those other aspects of these books be valued. So I just wanted to add that uh, to my response to that question. I, okay, um, I'm going to build on that um, and kind of combine some of the sound questions into one. We got three questions about sound, one about the question of, of hearing as racialized and how that might help us speak back to critics of um, by POC um, performers of Shakespeare. We got a question about the special insights that sound in performance provides us versus the visual or written representations. And then we got a question about, again, about racialized sound. And it says that, you know, one of the things that was striking in the introduction to my book is, is deconstructing the scream as a universal sound. And I actually look at and think about the ways that um, Black women's and white women's screams and how they're heard and, and processed um, in the, the media and uh, politically, et cetera, that, that there is no universal reaction to these, these gendered and race screams. And this person asked about kind of, says there's a well-known essay about Hamlet that focuses on the pure utterance beyond language at his death. Oh, 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 for instance. How do we get from the early modern playtext to these interpretive range of possibilities to vocalizations and plays? Are there other examples we could, we could look to? So three really good questions and um, for hearing is racialized and, and some great work on thinking about Shakespearean accents and the, the you know, in Ocampo Guzman's work that was in the Colorblind Shakespeare volume, which is also great. He talks a lot about this and his own experience. Um, he's Latin American and this great essay about speaking Shakespeare with an accent and that for him, you know, embodying Shakespeare and Shakespeare as a creative force means that we all approach him and kind of use him um, in a way that is in our most, you know, confident self. Um, and however that sounds, that it isn't about this, you know, kind of false sense of, of authenticity um, in, in the work. And so I really recommend, um, really recommends that um, his reading of that and his questioning of that, that accent. In terms of other works, um, I am sure, like, and we, we try to demonstrate how this sonic analysis might work, especially in terms of, again, soundscape and the work that that does, the world making. In video games, they call that worlding, right? How these sounds create the world. Who's listening to them? Are, does class make a difference? Does, you know, even right now, you know, as we pointed out, we're not all hearing the same things and the more that you can you know ask what are some other interpretations to this how my other characters in the play have heard this um, depending on their social position that might be a way to to play with that yeah and um, i guess i'll take the last few questions i'll try to truncate my uh, responses to them. So, yeah. so someone asked an, another good question. Um, you know, Du Bois identified education as one of the qualified successes of the Freedmen Bureau in the Reconstruction period. Can you discuss the pros and cons of using Shakespeare as a way to extend this project and potentially bridge the high school college divide? And so <clears throat> Du Bois deploys Shakespeare as cultural capital tool, which I've mentioned and Jennifer has mentioned as well. But for me, he also weaponizes Shakespeare in his work for his majority white audience, but yes. really he's weaponizing that the weapon that he's using for himself against whiteness is Shakespeare. Um, so in the line, I sit with Shakespeare and he wins is not, Du Bois has the agency. It's not Shakespeare sitting with him, he is sitting with Shakespeare. And so I take from his work the un that understanding that he has um, power and that I can also be empowered 
by, by reading his work. Moreover, by funding public education, you know, the Freedmen's Bureau sought to educate and increase literacy through writing and reading. And so Du Bois's attention to Shakespeare reinforces the value of that education that is not without challenges, of course, for the black reader or the black audience. You know, we think of what it means for a student to sit through Othello and just hear the disparaging language and the, you know, um, the thick lips and all of that stuff. It, it, it's, it's harmful, it is harmful. But um, Du Bois, I think, gets us to think differently about that um, because you know he notes that the South considered an educated Negro to be a dangerous Negro. And that point for me is really profound. Um, and it actually is something that tells me I need to try to acquire as much education as I can. And that includes Shakespeare um, so that I can be as dangerous as I can be, metaphorically speaking, of course. Um, and, and this is what I want for all students, regardless of their educational levels. I, I want them to feel that empowerment. And the last question here before I, I turn it over to, to Owen, um, how would you apply this type of sonic analysis to some of Shakespeare's other works in other yeah. genres, his lyric and amatory verse, his long narrative poetry, his sonnets? I thought this is a really fabulous um, question. And the answer is bigger than Shakespeare. And so I'm going to come at this um, broadly. First, uh, let me recommend that folks read chapter two in Kim Hall's Things of Darkness to get a sense of how she breaks down the poetics of color with respect to the Renaissance lyric and the language of darkness and fairness. I think that will help you in reading that. Um, you can relate it to then Jennifer's sonic color line theory and really think about how racialized sound is working outside of the dramatic genre. And even when they engage blackness, um, these non-dramatic works center on whiteness. So the sonic color line becomes useful then when reflecting on the voice of the white male speaker, or especially when the poem might include the woman's voice, as Spencer does in Amoretti. In such moments, we are prompted to think specifically about the white man and the white woman. And, and then we can move out from there to think about the how the power of whiteness is functioning. Mm -hmm. And on that note, um, I think we got through all the questions, so we will turn it over to Owen. Well, thank you both so much. That's been, you know, that was, that was an amazing uh, uh, conversation and presentation. Um, it's gonna give uh, lots of food, of, food for thought for, to uh, teachers at, at all levels in terms of how they might uh, cultivate an anti-racist and inclusive a classroom and what pedagogies they might employ. Um, we all, of course, would also like to send a special thanks to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for the support of the series and uh, to our audience and the uh, very lively Twitter feed that they uh, contributed during this. We okay. hope that many of you will be able to join us in September. We expect to resume with a session on race and empire that Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson of Johns Hopkins has organized. The team of scholars that she has assembled has expertise on the Americas, Europe, and the African continent and includes Robin Mitchell at Cal State Channel Islands and Cecile Fromont of Yale University. Further details on the full slate of critical race conversations will appear on the Folger Institute's webpage soon. We at the Folger Shakespeare Library thank you for your continuing support of our work with so many audiences from K-12 educators and their students who are served by the Folger Education Division to fellowships and advanced programming for graduate students and faculty run by the Folger Institute to the award-winning productions of the Folger Theater. If you are in a position to contribute, we will be grateful. Our institution was founded on philanthropy and your philanthropy will help us continue to support groundbreaking research and to share it with wider and more inclusive audiences, just as we did today. Now, as their final thought, Jennifer and David will sound off and sign off with a few lines from Keith Hamilton Cobb's groundbreaking play, American Moore which uses Shakespeare's character Othello to explore the experience, frustration, and perspective of black men. Perhaps as a complement to or substitute for Othello, David highly recommends instructors consider teaching this play, which contains an introduction by Professor Kim F. Hall. And now I turn things, over to, uh, turn, turn things back over to Jennifer and David, who will play the roles of the white director and the black male actor respectively from American Moore. Mm -hmm. Something else?
Leap and the net will appear. Pardon me? Um, yeah, Jennifer, before I jump into this speech again, may I, it is my sense that Othello has been this essential commodity to the Venetians for some time. And uh, well, frankly, he is the only large black entity in the room. He is aware that he comes at a premium to these men of the Senate and that he is unique, which is to say, I suspect that if he whispered his speech, the room would listen. Mm -hmm. And ending on that note, viewers, Jennifer and I thank you so much, tremendously really, for watching this critical race conversation and lending us your ears. We hope that you enjoyed the show. Mm -hmm.